Thank you, Ivan. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, again, just to correct uh, a little bit. Uh, my name is Balaji. Uh, I, I lead the product marketing at Influx Data. I've been also uh, in product team a lot. So past five years, I've been at Influx. But first four of them were, were in the product, mostly with Influx EV. I, I know a lot of you are wondering, hey, well, what the heck is Influx EV? If you're already familiar with Influx, uh, great. Um, awesome to have you use us. Uh, but I'm going to be uh, sharing a lot of high level information on what is Influx TV, why do you need, uh, why would you, under which circumstances you would consider Influx TV, and, and so on. So let me start with a statement first. I believe businesses, you can replace it with applications today, are defined by the experiences. I mean, what I mean by that is user experiences that they deliver. And, you know, case in point, these are some of the examples of um, really good. Uh, user experiences being delivered by applications. Uh, Tesla Powerwall, I mean, their home energy storage solution. Uh, obviously, Nest and Disney Plus, uh, they are pioneers in their own um, kind of worlds. Ravi is like uh, DoorDash, but in um, kind of South American uh, markets. So again, these are, uh, if you look at Tesla, there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes. You know, they have uh, solo panel, they have a great mobile application. Uh, you know, they, they uh, collect a lot of data that uh, appears kind of, when you look at their mobile application, you wonder hey, how, are, how are they able to do this? And uh, guess what? Behind the scenes, there's a lot of data that's happening. And behind the scenes, some of these applications are looking at data in real time, operating on them, uh, getting those analytics and insights. You know, these uh, uh, allow them to, for example, generate text messages when your delivery driver is nearby, for example. Again, all of these point uh, lead me to believe that, or lead me to state this, time series data is everywhere. It's a foundational element of pretty much a lot of the applications and services uh, that are out there. Um, you can imagine maybe you're, you're one of those people, we talk about SREs, we're going to come on later. If you're one of those people who are looking at Kubernetes environments and figuring out, hey, what kind of events? How do I uh, do anomaly detection? How do I correlate different metrics and events and try to get those insights that you're looking for? Well, guess what? You're dealing with time series data. Um, what are some of the use cases, if you if you build, right? So these are some of the use cases that I, I think are relevant. Uh, typically, again, uh, to give an example, one of the customers that I've worked with um, over the years, uh, they had at one point like 22 different applications. They're a large enterprise company, uh, many different applications, each application team using their own monitoring observability solution. They actually found that um, they could consolidate all of them with Influx TV as a backend and you know, using um, Influx TV as a metrics data like for those monitoring observability. Um, some of the other things, if you're an IoT customer, IoT again, industrial IoT, consumer IoT, uh, maybe you're launching space uh, rockets. Um, we have several of those companies, or you're using IoT maybe in an industrial setting where you're monitoring sensors uh, from a, a factory floor. Um, if you're familiar with PTC or uh, Rockwell Automation, some of those people, they use uh, Influx under, uh, under the behind the scenes. Or if you're building a custom application, custom analytics application, maybe uh, you're like Edge Delta, who's building a, uh, a, a log analytics solution, uh, or maybe you want to build your own tracing as a service platform. All of these, again, uh, behind the scenes, uh, you are looking at time series data. Um, so what are some of the challenges with managing time series data? Um, uh, to give you an example, uh, one of our customers, Panopto, they were an IT service provider. Um, they offer monitoring services to their end users. So imagine that your end users or end customers want to monitor the environment. They would offer them, hey, we will manage it for you. We'll monitor it. Here's the custom agent. We'll collect that data. You can just look at the dashboards and so on. Um, initially, they started their journey with MySQL. MySQL is very familiar with everybody. It's very simple, SQL. So they started using it immediately as they grew they hit into this massive scale problem. You know, as they scaled out, they could find that data was dropped or uh, uh, critical queries were not being returned in, in, in a suitable um, kind of timeframe. Uh, there were several timeouts. 
whole end user experience was not very great. Again, this could happen because you're looking at a time series data where time, uh, this, uh, the data is emitted really, really at a massive scale and volume continuously at high speed. Um, so you need something to, to really collect that. Or maybe you're trying to take action in real time. You know, if you're doing anomaly detection, um, something happened and you want to immediately fire off alerts uh, or an automation or orchestration script behind the scenes, um, these things, again, could could mean that you are trying to take action in real time. Your queries need to come back in, in seconds, milliseconds, and so on. Um, the third kind of challenge will be data cardinality. Again, um, when you're dealing with um, logs or traces and so on, there's a lot of information in the, collected in those uh, uh, mediums that you want to collect as contact information. With the context, um, you collect them as tags or columns. And each of these contexts, um, the tags and columns need to be stored and indexed in memory. That could cause explosion of that index uh, that you need to store. And that could cause indirectly, like if you're trying to query, um, that could cause query slowdowns and so on. Again, high cardinality is a, it is a very known problem in a, in a time series world. Again, all of these things uh, happen at a massive scale. If you're, if you're really not having a massive scale, you probably can use any kind of database and, and uh, be able to use it with that. Um, most general purpose databases simply cannot handle these challenges, right? So why is that? Typically, these databases like MySQL, Postgres, uh, they're optimized for processing transaction, OLTP, in other words. Um, they prioritize data consistency. Hey, if I can uh, connect into this replica or that replica, am I seeing the same thing? That's what data consistency really means. Um, they're not built for this high, high volume time scales workloads. You know, if you have 10,000 writers writing at the same time and 10,000 queries querying for the same data, they're not built for that. Um, the other thing that could happen is a, a data lifecycle management. What do I mean by that? When data comes in, the near-term data is most important. You're look, looking for anomaly detection the past five minutes, past 15 minutes, and so on. As data age, you, they're not that important, but you still want to keep them around. You want to do trending. Maybe you want to do comparison with last month. So you still want them, but, you know, they're not immediately needed, right? So you can maybe run an offline report and so on. But data lifecycle management means that the uh, the aging data, you can keep it in a different partition and the most current data, you want to keep them around and make it really fast and so on. So all of these are not built into these general purpose databases. You could essentially do all of these on your own, like create database partitions for based on time and so on. But again, these take energy, they take valuable resources and, and time. Um, InfluxDB, on the other hand, it's purpose built for the time series data. Uh, we've been around for quite a while. There's a, we are very well known in the community. Uh, the reason is that uh, we really redesigned and architected InfluxDB for managing these large volumes of time series data. Um, we, uh, we have non-blocking high volume writes and reads, which means that, hey, uh, 10,000 writers and 10,000 queries trying to look at the same data behind the scenes, they are not blocking. You can write and read at the same time. We prioritize read and write availability over data consistency, meaning our data is eventually consistent. Eventually, all of your replicas and, and cluster nodes will have that data. Uh, so you may have to do some, some um, application level logic that can deal with these consistency issues. But hey, you will never be seeing drop data. You will always, your queries will always be available. They will always work. Um, and then data lifecycle management is really built in. We have data retention that can be set as, hey, after a day, evict the data or store it or archive it and so on. Um, recently, we launched a InfluxDB 3.0. This is a recent product. Uh, we've been working on it for a year and a half now. This is built with Rust. Uh, it's a columnar database. I mean, InfluxDB is already fast, but we noticed that you know some of our customers came back and said, hey, um, I'm really looking for real-time data, like millisecond. They need to come back in, in that. Also, uh, a few other uh, customers, especially in the FinTech world, they want to keep that data for around for longer. Um, like years, so you're talking about five to seven years and so on. Typically these customers, you can see that um, they would archive that data in S3 because again, uh, we use SSE storage store um, devices behind the scenes as storage. Uh, they're great, but they're pretty expensive. Um, so these, uh, they would archive that data, create code, 
uh, to really do that. And when you really want to query, you have to load it back into memory again. So all of these things uh, happens, uh, like in fact, db 3 is built with those, those features in mind. And unlimited carnality, we have eliminated the carnality problem. Now we can store as much amount of indexes, tags, as column as you want. And uh, the way we did that, we, we used catalog service and it just, uh, it's sorted and optimized. And we have a lot of parallel processing that happens that just seems to just work without needing to store these indexes in memory and trying to access them. So essentially you can have billions of carnality. We have several customers, real life customers actually using InflectDB Triado as a backend for metrics, events, and places together uh, without hitting any of these cardinality issues. Um, so how fast are we? I mean, when you talk, talk about performance, hey, you're, you're so great. We want to compare with ourselves, uh, all of our previous versions, 1.8 and 2.x, uh, open source. We took the biggest, uh, largest EC2 machine, try to put that in and try to compare, okay, what's the workload that we can run there? And what's the workload that we can run a smallest InflectDB3 cloud dedicated? And if you want detailed benchmark, um, kind of how we did it, the methodology, we can look at that URL. Uh, but essentially, uh, the bottom line is that we made it extremely fast. We have separated storage and compute, so which means that ingest is very, very efficient. We are like 45 to 50x better right throughput on a very small hardware. And uh, we are really fast, like we made up to 45x faster for recent queries, recent data, five minute, things like that are in memory and so on. Even for one hour, we tested for an hour, but we think that we can also be scalable to 24 hours or even maybe greater than that. You could see the mileage reduce, but up to 25x faster queries for the past one hour data and storage cost reduction. Now we use S3 by default, or S3 or the object store in any of these cloud environments by default. So not only that, we have highest compression, so we offer greater than 90% uh, store reduction and storage costs. So drilling down into some of the storage compression performance, for example, you can see here that this is the data close to 200 million records. Uh, we're talking about 24 hours of data. Uh, you can see that typically in an open source, again, we have compression there as well. It, uh, it would compress to about nine gigabytes and whereas uh, on InfluxDB 3.0, we got about 4.5, maybe 5X compression. So we, we use Apache Park A. Again, this is a well-known format behind the scenes. It has a very high compression. Uh, as I mentioned, we use the storage, uh, cloud object storage for storing the data automatically. You don't have to archive it, just part of that architecture. So that gives you, again, SSD versus S3, um, it, it, it's uh, anywhere from 5X to 10X reduction in cost. So that overall gives you mostly greater than 90% reduction in your storage cost. Um, from a query performance perspective, we ran about 20 queries, um, one of the, um, some of the queries were aggregation queries. These are things like they are looking for count or sum or min or max. Uh, again, there are two types of aggregate queries that we ran, and you can see, okay, not great. I mean, we still 2.5x faster overall, um, but the way we really perform really well is uh, when you're trying to group by and you're looking for, hey, let's uh, get these results grouping by these four. And uh, these were from last five five minutes. You can see the number of record counts that is actually going through. Uh, we think this is pretty pretty impressive. So your data coming back, your queries coming back in in less than a second for uh, for pretty much the group by order by. Um, why is this? How how did we make it faster? So again, I don't want to get into too much of details, but just to give you a sneak peek, we use real time um, uh, kind of we use the Apache uh, Aero format, um, and all of our systems internally for um, they understand Apache Aero. So Apache Aero is very well known for a columnar representation of data, and we can use it to they they have great so they they don't have like they call it zero copy so which means that you can send from one core or one of the nodes the other other nodes really really fast without doing serialization and deserialization all of those things really suited for the columnar in memory analytics and optimized for those recent edge of data that's why you feel like anything you have last five minutes if you're doing an alert if you're doing threshold queries these would be really fast um query performance but grouping by time for example 
Um, these are, again, you're looking at last 60 minutes, about 9 million records, really, really uh, great, great performance. There are aspects where we found that, in fact, DB 3.0 was less performant than open source 1.8. Uh, I don't have that slide here, but those were because we partition by default by time. Uh, we have uh, configurations that allow you to partition by, uh, by specific columns, and that will make those queries faster as well. So overall, we really spent a lot of effort on making 3.0 really fast, faster than the older versions of Influx. And uh, this is just, uh, we have a blog post that talks more about this, but it's mostly we've done take advantage of a lot of things, rectified execution, push down strategies, and parallelism and so on to, to make uh, these queries really fast. Um, so if you want to run Influx DB3, you can run on cloud and on premise. Um, we have a version ser cloud serverless that is available um, that allows you to um, sign up free, uh, convert to a pay as you go model, just pay for usage. We have a cloud dedicated that's only dedicated for your work, work, workload if you want. And these can run AWS, Google Cloud, um, Microsoft Azure. Existing versions today, we already have AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure support. The, 3.0 is only supported on AWS, but it's coming pretty soon, you know, maybe in the next quarter or so on Google Cloud and the Azure as well. Uh, and then clustered and edge with our on-premise options. We will by September the first week, we should um, we should be um, the cluster should be out and we would have a major announcement on that. Um quickly before I wrap up, this is how if you're an IoT customer, you're like, hey, how do I do the edge to cloud replication? This is kind of an example scenario of how you could be doing it to collect the data using Telegraph um, and have an InfluxDB edge, which is a single node instance at the edge to collect your data, transform your data, even local alerts and all of those things, you, which will serve your field technicians. So you can also summarize that data and then only take the replication or replicate those summaries of that data, keep it in cloud for central hub, you know, for summaries, visualization, long-term retention, ML, and so on. Um, that's it. If you're really looking at time series data, um, I think InfluxDB should be in your pocket um, just to look at things. Um, and these are some of the metrics that we collected from actual customers. Um, sign up for free if you want. Um, and we have a free tier, like I mentioned, it will be AWS, but uh, in a quarter, so we should have support for Google as well. That is it. This was my last slide. Hope this was useful.